First and foremost, uh, I want to um, welcome everybody this evening. Again, my name is Scott Krylik. I'm president of the Springfield Township Historical Society. And uh, today is December 9th, 2021. Um, before I introduce our speaker for this evening, for 2021, uh, our uh, corporate sponsors are Michael DeLorentis for Concrete Work, uh, BQ Basement Systems, Compass Real Estate, Russell Roofing, Pilot Conservation, Dan Helwig Realtors, Mara Restoration, John Murray Funeral Home, and Coxie Too Good. Um, and uh, again, thank you to, uh, to each and every one of our sponsors. Um, they've uh, uh, provided a, a wonderful source of uh, revenue that um, has allowed our society to, uh, uh, to function this last year. Um, you're, uh, uh, you recently received a, um, a letter from me, actually, uh, asking for uh, additional um, support for the, for the friends, uh, excuse me, for the uh, society, uh, as a friend of the society. Uh, if, you're, if you have the capacity to become a, a sponsor, um, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. I hope you'll consider that. And, um, and then we will. Now. Our speaker this evening is uh, Frank Quattrone. Um, Frank uh, teaches public speaking. Uh, he's taught at uh, Penn State Abington since 1997 uh, when it became a four year college. Prior to that, he was a newspaper editor at Montgomery Newspapers uh, for its ticket entertainment section. Uh, he has written two Arcadia books on Ambler, uh, in addition to the book Penn State Abington and the Yogan School. Uh, so uh, uh, I know uh, Frank will be discussing the evolution of the Yogan School, uh, which was a school for affluent young ladies um, uh, to Penn State, a uh, Penn State Abington, a Commonwealth campus of the Penn Pennsylvania State University. Uh, that has an enrollment of approximately 4,000 undergraduate students. And i um, very happy to have Frank with us this evening. Uh, sort of the genesis of this program, um, uh, I was doing genealogical research of my own and found that uh, uh, my wife had uh, three great aunts uh, that all attended the Yogan School, uh, two of whom graduated. Um, the third did not, but, uh, but two, two did. Uh, so that, me, that, that led me to, uh, to find um, Frank and uh, uh, the archives at, uh, at the Penn State campus. And um, so uh, here we are. So uh, welcome, Frank. And I will uh, share my, allow you to uh, share your screen. So Frank, you are now uh, the host and you should be able to share your screen. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you very much, Scott and, and Katie of Worrell for inviting me and the society as well. And I wish all elections were as, as simple and as uh, cordial um, and kind and, <laughs> and as meaningful as yours just now. It would make the world so much nicer. Right? But anyway, thank you for inviting me. I do appreciate it. I am going to share my screen and I want to, uh, I, I, I hope that I'm, I'm not going to overwhelm you. It's not my intention. But I, uh, I think that you might enjoy the story of evolution. And this is the evolution of a, an exclusive finishing school for wealthy young ladies whose families hoped they would marry well. Now, how did Penn State Abington become what it is? A diverse, inclusive, small college within a a major research university. How did this happen? It's, it's quite an evolution. And I'm hoping that with a few dozen slides that I won't go through in great detail, will give you a good idea of how evolution works. And again, it's like genealogy also. Uh, Scott, you mentioned that uh, two members of, of your wife's family attended Ogon's there was a club called the Kin Club, uh, and uh, the Kin Club uh, included everyone who ever had a relative who attended the school for the uh, Ogon School for Young Ladies. Uh, at one point, 
uh, it was determined that 55% of the graduates of the Ogon School for Young Ladies ha had relatives who had attended the school at some point. So it's, it's pretty interesting. So let me give you an idea of where we came from and I'll try to make this as entertaining as possible as well. 100 years of education. I wrote this book in 1916 because that was 100 year of uh, 2016. I'm sorry, I'm not that old. Uh, it was 100 years from the time the school first established its presence at the site it now exists in 1600 Woodland Road in Abington. That was when Abby Sutherland, the longtime, almost 40 year president and owner of the school, bought that property and had it developed. So here we go, 100 years of education at 1600 Woodland Road. How did it begin? Okay. Well, uh, this is the cover of the book. And the reason this was chosen is because this was the first time in 1950 that young men and young women could attend the school at the same time because it was an all girls school, very exclusive. You had to be wealthy. You had to be um, prepared to marry into a very good family where there were ambassadors, major politicians, businessmen, captains of commerce, and you were going to be the wife, the great wife who knew how to do tea time properly and could speak eloquently and who knew about literature and language and who traveled the world because this is what education was like back in the old days in 1850 when the school came into being. Here's the first school, the first iteration of Penn State Abington. It's the Chestnut Street Female Seminary. It was located at 1615 Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. It was a four-story building that had enough room for 20 students, 20, and they were all very wealthy. And this is the oldest photo in existence of the college. It goes back to 1850. And this is quite interesting also. Uh, what? No spell check? This was the, the sign, the door plate above the original building. Do you notice anything, Scott, that was a little bit uh, unusual? Oh, it looks like there's a T missing. Yes, uh, there was no spell check in those days, obviously, but this was, it was spelled C-H-E-S-N-U-T, Chestnut Street. And it's, say, it's a shame, it's an institute of higher education, but there was a misspelling. That, anyway, I think it's kind of a, a, a fun note, but these are, the, these are the early days. These are the first principles. And the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is because we're talking about evolution. We're talking about genealogy. How did this great school that we have today come into being? The first principles were Mary Bonney. She was from upstate New York. And her friend, Harriet DeLay, was a young, a, an elegant Quaker woman from Philadelphia who had very different values. Mary Bonney was, a, was salt of the earth, well-educated, but she started the National Indian Foundation back in the 1840s. It was called the National Indian Association at the time. And she was the subject of a PBS special about three years ago. I thought that was quite interesting. And Harriet DeLay had uh, Quaker values. This is how she inspired the young ladies of the college. What do you think of this? She said, young ladies, aim at the moon. And if you will hit the church steeple, but... If you aim at the church steeple, you will hit the ground. Great way to inspire them. It's like Robert Browning's famous quote, uh, a, a person's reach should exceed his grasp. Try to, to aim a little bit further than you think you're capable of going and you'll become even bigger and better than you are. These, this is the first graduating class. How old do you think these people are? The first graduating class, it's a dozen young ladies, 1866. They're 18 years old, but don't they look like they're in their late 20s, early 30s, maybe older? Times have changed, as you will soon see, but this is the first graduating class. By the way, uh, they used to be called uh, uh, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and they added a designation graduating class uh, sometime in the 1860s. So there were girls graduating, but this is the first official 
graduating class. Now, the school really took off in the 1880s, uh, and actually, sorry, 1850, because this is the man who saved the Union during the Civil War, and he also launched uh, Penn State Ogons, the Ogon School for Young Ladies, because, because he was a financier from Ohio who had a major position in Philadelphia working for a bank, and he raised millions of dollars in bond issues to support the Union cause during the Civil War. And it was this man who saved the Chestnut Street Female Seminary. He started to lose money uh, on railroad investments and decided at, at, in 1883 that he couldn't maintain his mansion any longer. He, had, he built this mansion that cost a million dollars in 1867. It was located in Elkins Park, uh, Washington Lane, not too far from Cheltenham Avenue, believe it or not. It's been raised since then. But this, he's decided, would be a good school for the Chestnut Street Female Seminary and for uh, the sum of $50,000 a year in rental. He said, this can be your new school. And so from 1883, until uh, uh, 1916, uh, this was the school called the Ogon School for Young Ladies. And uh, it was quite a deal uh, for $50,000 a year. Why, how did it get the name Ogons? Because when uh, Jay Cook was growing up in, um, in Sandusky, Ohio, this, uh, this gentleman, he was a, a, an Ottawa uh, Native American chieftain. He was living in the neighborhood and he used to come over and talk with uh, Jay Cook and his uh, siblings. And he told them wonderful stories about the Native American life. And he loved this man so much because he was a great storyteller that he said, you, you, we can make this deal uh, to Harriet uh, DeLay and Mary Bonnie if you would name the school for young ladies. And that is a, the original medallion. It's located in the archives below the library and uh, in, in the uh, Woodland Building in, in Penn State Abington. And right, at, uh, um, I don't know if you could see this, but this, this is a replica right above the main door to the main building of Sutherland Hall that still exists. The first thing people see as they walk in the building. Mary uh, Frances Bennett was the next principal and he, she is here. Uh, this is what one of the classrooms looked like back in the 1880s. She's teaching history. She loved William Shakespeare, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and she shared her love of literature and history with the young ladies. Social climbers? Not really. But these were some of the young ladies uh, dressed in casual clothes, uh, climbing a chestnut tree, a tr chestnut tree uh, on the uh, on the campus grounds. They they loved walking and uh, enjoying the ponds and so on. Now this young lady, <laughs> Sylvia Eastman, was, uh, became very, very famous, and I'll tell you a story about her a little bit later, but as a principal of the school from 1877 to 1912, not only did she champion art, astronomy, history, and math, but she introduced the first women's military drill in the country, in America, ever. It was almost unheard of at the time, uh, and the reason for it the, the girls would march uh, uh, twice a week uh, with uh, wooden rifles, not real guns, wooden rifles on their shoulder to give them walking exercise, uh, to give them an opportunity to interact with each other, to move in formation. It was, it was just, it was part of their uh, gymnasium, if you will. And it became so popular. This is a scene uh, on the main driveway of uh, of the campus in 1893, that people from all over the world, world leaders in, in America and around the world, wrote comments commending the school for doing a military drill for women. It's really something. Uh, this was a, a magazine, Ladies Home Journal. I'm sure you've heard of it. It was actually published by, um, the, by Hiram Curtis. He was the father of Mary Curtis. Mary Curtis, very famous graduate, of the school, attended the school in the 1890s 
and she was writing under her mother's name while she was still a teenager for Ladies Home Journal, published right here in Philadelphia. And this photo at the top is a, a photo of the, one of the military drills. I'm gonna talk more about Mary Curtis a little later. Just wanted you to know that the Curtis Publishing Company uh, is part of the history of the school as well. Uh, the solarium is one of the most popular uh, rooms, if you will, at, at meeting places at the college. And you could see uh, these the ferns and the, the, the uh, imported chandelier from, from uh, Austria made it a really inviting place uh, for the girls to gather. They also had uh, minstrel shows. And when it was not, when it was still politically correct, if you will, or it's not politically incorrect, they had, uh, they dressed as pirates, as Indians, as robbers, as cowboys. Uh, and this is a story. Okay. Anyway, this just is an example of, of some of the fun that the girls had at the school. This was the class of, of 1910. The students came from as far away as Minneapolis, Denver, Florida, California, and Princeton and the main line. They dressed in white and there was quite a bit of camaraderie. And as you know, from photos and from the early days, no one ever smiled. Now, the school took a major move forward when Abby Sutherland became the president and eventually the owner of the school. She was a New, New England girl who uh, lived in uh, New England and then later Nova Scotia with a Presbyterian background. But she also went to Radcliffe College, which was one of the most progressive schools in the country. And she brought her, her Presbyter Presbyterian of a value system, as well as the progressive education she learned at Radcliffe to the, the new school. I would say new school for her, because she was a teacher there. And um, uh, uh, Sylvia Eastman saw in her a dynamic force. And this is actually what happened. She became um, the, the mentor of so many young ladies. It, it was just an, an, an incredible transformation. This is... Uh, Abby Sutherland right here, if you can see I'm uh, circling her with, with my cursor. And she gave talks with the girls every Sunday uh, in the solarium, which I showed you earlier. And they were like, almost like sermons, but they were like sermons, not boring, but they were about uh, chastity, about honesty, about uh, fortitude, uh, all, all of the, the, the basic virtues. And she would teach the girls. It was not a formal class, but this is the kind of person she was. She was beloved. She was formidable because she had so much talent. This, by the way, 1916, is the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the building stone, the cornerstone of, of Sutherland Hall. It was the first building completed on the new campus. Uh, so uh, one reason I chose to write this book when I did was celebrating the 100th anniversary of the college at that location. Even though it wasn't called Penn State, Ogons or Abington just yet, it was still the Ogon School for Young Ladies. And this is what the school looked like from the air, look in 1961, a little bit like Downton Abbey perhaps, I'm not sure, but this track that you see, the, the, the main circle in front of the building, well, the, the rich, exclusive young ladies who had first attended the school would be driven here uh, in chauffeured uh, uh, carriages. And pretty soon there were cars <laughs> driving through here. So there was a, really a big transformation. And this is a very important figure in the history of the school. Julian Abel, the first black man to graduate from the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in architecture in 1902. He designed Sutherland Hall and four or five of the main buildings on the campus today, all built in the 1920s. He built over 400, designed over 400 buildings during his career, including he worked for the Horace Trumbauer Company, really famous company uh, that built uh, Widener University, a uh, Widener Library at Harvard. Uh, it built the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and it also in the ninth, late 1920s, uh, Julian Abel uh, led the, the building of, of the largest, uh, one of the largest 
building projects in the South ever at that time. The West Campus of Duke University was also designed by Julian Abel, a, a, a tremendous towering figure in architecture. And all of the buildings that he, he designed still exist on campus and are used today. In fact, I taught my last two speech classes for the semester today and one of them, the conference center. So in uh, 2015, the Black Student Union dedicated a plaque to him in Sutherland Hall. This building, I just came from here. There was a chancellor's reception for faculty and donors to the college. It's Lair's, Lair's building. This was Abby Sutherland's home for many years. I'll tell you a little bit more about her story a little later as it comes up. Um, that home was, that building was called Lair's, was named after Roman demigods to, who protect the household. And this is a very unusual education system. It's, it's not just learning how to read, not learning how to write and uh, learn languages, learn uh, about history, uh, learning about various cultures. It was also where a very unusual course called domestic engineering took place. For two weeks during the year, all the students at the Ogon School for Young Ladies would come to Lairs and they would work with uh, nurses who were, uh, who, who were like uh, pe pediatric nurses, and they would teach the young girls how to raise children, how to take care of children. The most unusual part of the educational system that certainly never gets any sway today. But this is an example of how unusual the Ogon School was. Domestic engineering, think about that. And this is Abby Sutherland. See the world and expand your horizons. She's sitting below the Acropolis in uh, Athens. This is a, this, is, this photo was taken in uh, 1961, I believe. And this is her nephew. His name is Donald Sutherland. It's not the famous actor who appeared at the Hunger Games and include and many, many other uh, great programs. But uh, one of the principles of the Ogon School was to travel, see the world, practice the languages we're teaching you in the, in the country where they originate, whether it's Japan or Germany or Greece or France or Italy, but go to those countries, learn the language, interact with, with the, the natives and learn their culture firsthand. Again, why, why this was such an exclusive and wonderful school. But the girls also were being raised and trained to become wives of famous men and they had to learn the proper matters of tea time. And here's an example of a tea time, uh, 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 what would you call it? I guess it's not a seminar, but a tea time session in 1934 in the solarium. The girls were learning how to take care of pro uh, important guests properly. And this is uh, interesting. The White, the White Mountain Camp in New Hampshire still exists. This was built by Abby's husband, who was actually a cowboy she met in Dallas on a vacation. I'm sorry, in Colorado. And he, uh, for some reason, she was open to uh, a relationship with a cowboy who could teach her uh, ways of, of, the, of the wilderness that she was never exposed to. And he personally helped build these cabins uh, in the New Hampshire wilderness. The college does not own them anymore, but they still exist and they still offer uh, classes and uh, wilderness training and so on, even today as we speak. Uh, Scott, this is what I was telling you about earlier. This is a, a photo of the Kin Club. And uh, by, this is taken in 1941 before a reunion dinner. By the time the Ogon School closed in 1950, a, a more than half of the student body had close relatives who had once attended the school. And they got together every year for a reunion. And this is just an example. Um, it, it, it's like uh, everyone loved the school so much, they encouraged the relatives to attend. Here is the last graduating class of the Ogon School for Young Ladies. Notice how different they look from the girls in, in, um, in 1866. Those, those 12 young ladies who look like old women, uh, they, here they are and they're smiling for the camera. How times have changed. This is the last graduating class. Someone was really unhappy when the school changed from the Ogon School for Young Ladies 
to the to Penn State Ogons. And I'll tell you who he is when we get to the photo of his mom. Abington evolves eventually from Ogons. So let's talk about how that happened. In 1950, something happened. Uh, Penn State, <laughs> uh, Penn State College at the time uh, was looking for a new campus somewhere near Philadelphia. And the, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court discovered something that Abby Sutherland and the Ogon School for Young Ladies had not paid any taxes for several years. Now, Abby Sutherland was not trying to get away with anything, but she honestly believed, she was not as worldly wise as you might think, she honestly believed that educational institutions didn't have to pay taxes. But this was a profit, it was a for-profit college. And she did not have the $5 million that was owed in back taxes. And think about that, in 1950, the $5 million is probably closer to 10 or 12 today. I mean, I'm, sure, I'm not sure I'm getting this right, but she was a very crafty lady also. And she said, I'll tell you what, why don't we do this? I know that Penn State College, which soon became a university, is looking for a campus near Philadelphia. I will donate the grounds, all of the grounds, all of the buildings to Penn State College if you will forgive the debt. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court and Montgomery County said, wow, that's a good deal, man. We really love that. Yes, we'll do it. It took Abby Sutherland 33 years to pay down the debt. She took out bonds back in the 19, I guess around 1910, she began taking out bonds before the school actually began being built at, that, at our present site in 1916. It took her 33 years to pay it off. She wasn't wealthy. She was a, a, a really bright, uh, forward-thinking, progressive, sturdy American woman who understood the value of education. And this is what it became. Uh, it became Penn State Ogons. Uh, she said, I have one, quali one um, qualification to, to this deal. You have to let me live on the premises until I die. <laughs> and the Supreme Court and the state, the county of Montgomery said, well, I think we could manage that. And they let her live at, at in the Lairs building, which I showed you earlier. That's where the domestic engineering course took place. And she, the people stay, say they still see her ghost wandering uh, on, on Sutherland Hall and, and sometimes in the Lairs building. Obviously, ghosts don't exist. And people like to tell the story because Abby Sutherland's imprint and footprint was so powerful. She was such a force for good that uh, people let the, the legend live on. But this is, the, this is what the campus looked like uh, in, in 1961. In 1973, the first box type building was built on campus. This is the physical education building. And it was the largest building on campus. And obviously the old style, Julian Abel, Horace Trumbauer, that kind of faded into the past. By the way, they also built gray towers at Arcadia University. This is all part of the uh, Horace Trumbauer style. Beautiful, solid brick buildings uh, that will last forever unless an earthquake topples them or heavy machinery raising old buildings. But this uh, building actually was uh, mocked by so many because it was big box and it was, it was so modern, but it actually won some design awards. So obviously times change. This is part of the, the evolution, not only of an educational institution, but also of architecture. I want to give you an idea of the kind of students that have attended the school. Bob Barton, he's a, a, an honored former physical education director of the college, he became the athletic director, but he was first an unsuccessful student. As a freshman at Ogons, at the Ogon, Penn State Ogons, he flunked <laughs> several courses. He said, you know what, what I should do is probably go into the army, uh, maybe get my mind clear. And so Bob Barton did that. He went into the army, came back, he re-enrolled in, in the college, ended up on the dean's list and became Wes Ol Olson's protege. Wes Olson was the athletic director of the time. 
and he knew that Bob worked really hard. And Bob became one of the most beloved members of the, of, of the campus staff for years and years. Here's an example of what the girls might have looked like when they were uh, <laughs> marching in the good old days. This is the 1985 Ogon School Reunion. And the girls here all were graduates of the Ogon School for Young Ladies. And all of them, I mean, they hated the uniforms. Notice how many are wearing one. One young lady, she was very proud of the drills. It was said that the girls hated these drills, but they got a lot out of them. In retrospect, they thought, well, you know, we did learn comradeship. We learned how to march in unison, not that it's gonna help us in life, but we, but we learned, we had calisthenics and uh, we, it, it kept us physically fit and it got a lot of interesting attention. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll have to tell you the story now, I guess. The military drill was so famous because it was so unusual that it, an incredibly uh, a, 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 how did, a charismatic world leader wrote a letter in the early 1930s congratulating the school, Abby Sutherland and her school for teaching these young women military drill, a military drill and how to be um, disciplined and so on. Uh, that letter was framed, it was a, a letter of honor for years in the main lobby of Sutherland Hall, but it has since disappeared. I wonder if anyone can tell me who that person was. Why would a letter from a world famous leader that was sent in the 1930s disappear? Anyone have an idea? Scott, can you figure it out? I, uh, my, my guess would be that that uh, world leader became uh, uh, very unpopular um, at, at some point in the next yes. uh, decade and a half or so. Adolf Hitler. Right. Yeah. Adolf Hitler was the person. And uh, I, I did a lot of research and I could not find what happened to the letter. Uh, I, I tracked it to an article in the Philadelphia Bulletin uh, back around 1958 or so. And this, the only thing the writer of the article could say is that uh, obviously the school did not want to be congratulated for anything by someone who had been responsible for the death of 12 million people not just 6 million Jews, but 6 million other people as well. Uh, we're talking about uh, the LGBT community. We're talking about Catholics. We're talking about union members. We're talking about anyone who disagreed with the policy of the National Socialist Party of Germany. So anyway, this was a fun reunion in 1985. And here, Penn State Ogons becomes Penn State Abington. This is a celebration. July 1st, 1997, Karen Wiley Sandler, who was the chancellor of the college for uh, something like uh, 38 years, she said, this is, this is Karen Sandler in the middle. She, she left the college in uh, 2016 after serving it quietly and extremely well. One, wonderful, wonderful woman. I, I'm still in touch with her. She said, we are celebrating that we were named Penn State Abington and designated as a Penn State campus college, one of only five in the Commonwealth. It was a happy time. And this was, this was a reunion uh, that, that took place every year um, in July. So we are now a campus of the college of Penn State University. I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the famous people who, Oh no, what did I do? Oh, okay, here we go. Now, these are two visionaries, Len Mastaza and Ellen Canote. Len Mastaza, some of you may recognize, he's one of the country's foremost uh, of critics, if you will, uh, people who know and speak on Frank Sinatra. Uh, he, he had a, a program on radio for many years, uh, playing Sinatra. He interviewed Sinatra many times and he's written a number of books, but he's, he's essentially an academic. He was the associate dean of the college at the time. And here he is winning the Lion Heart Award. It's the first time the award was ever given for a faculty member or a staff member who dedicated so much to the college that his or her contribution deserved special attention. And Ellen Canote, 
She was the first arts and humanities division head, and she is retiring tomorrow. This was taken in 2000, and I think these are two of the most wonderful people I've ever met. Why are they visionaries? Because they hired me. <laughs> they, they, they said, we know you're a teacher, Frank. We know you're a journalist. We have read Ticket. We love your newspaper, and we've heard that you won teacher's awards, and you would do wonders for the college if you would do something for us. And I said, what would you like me to do? I said, we would like you to teach, of course, teach our students how to put a newspaper together. I said, really? You would like me to do that? They said, absolutely. So I did. I accepted their invitation. And in 1997, in, in uh, August, just two months after the college became a, a two-year college and a four-year college, students could get an associate degree, but also 18 majors at the college itself and 150 majors if they moved from two years at Penn State Abington to the main campus or one of the other branch campuses, uh, and they could major in 150 different uh, subjects. So they asked me to, to start a newspaper, and I did. It was called The Lion's Roar. First issue came out October 27th, 1997. I would take my students uh, over to the newspaper because we didn't have the proper software at the college to put a newspaper together. And on Saturdays and Sundays for two or three consecutive weeks, in addition to what we did in the classroom, we would put a newspaper together. And we did two issues of the Lion's War every year from 1997 until 2017, I'm sorry, 2019, when the college told me we don't need a newspaper anymore. And I was heartbroken and I still am because I, I loved teaching these students who became newspaper editors and marketing directors and did wonderful things with the skills they learned, how to interview, how to put publications together. And I, I included this in my book and I wanted to include it in the program because in, uh, in, on de December 10th in 2015, we're reporting that one of my former students Leonard, <laughs> Angelo Malone. He was the first editor of The Lion's Roar. He edited this publication. He came back to talk to my students about how the skills he learned in my class got him to become the director of Drexel University's nursing programs marketing department. And he came up with all kinds of programs to bring students into Drexel's uh, uh, graduate medical school. And uh, Andrew, Angela Malone is now working in uh, Orlando, Florida, where he's always wanted to work. He wants to be close to Disney World. He loves it there, hopes to work there someday as their marketing director. He's getting closer and closer, but he was one of my best students ever. So my, my experience with the Lion's Roar was part of the history of the college. We, we, um, we did some beautiful work. And there are two distinguished colleagues, uh, Judith Newman, uh, she teaches in, in a sociology department. She's won a couple of faculty, uh, best fac distinguished faculty awards. And Thomas Smith, uh, Tom helped me to edit my book. Oh, I'm sorry, holding it upside down. Uh, Penn State Abington and the Ogon School. Uh, and he did this uh, gratis just because he wanted to help me uh, to tell the story of, of Penn State's growth as a uh, from, a, from a, 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 a girl's school, a finishing school, to a very inclusive, diverse college. Two other well-known uh, faculty members, Moylan Mills, he is still giving pr presentations. He loves talking about movies and opera. Uh, he still gives lectures. He was also an interim chancellor of the college for a, a couple of years. And uh, Russ Brinkert, who kept inviting me to the college before I was asked to work there full time. Um, he wanted me to uh, talk to his corporate communication students about how they could use the skills that we learn in, journal in journalism to, to make uh, life more exciting for businesses and so on. And Ross Brinker passed away from a rare form of brain cancer last year. So we are kind of sad, but I'm glad I was able to get him into the book. And by the way, this is the layers that the building I was telling you that this is the section where Abby Sutherland lived. This was her home 
until the time she died. And I'll tell you, she, she uh, gave up the school in 1950 and for the rest of her life until she died in I think, 1966, she got a degree, uh, her, her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. She already had a master's degree and she kept on teaching courses and taking courses until she died in her 80s. A wonderful woman. Now, there are a couple of famous people who went to the school, and I thought you might want to hear about a few of them. I promise not to take too much time, but even some who didn't graduate made their mark. Here goes one, Amelia Earhart. Probably some of you know this because you, you're in a historical society, and maybe you just, you know, do some reading, but our favorite fly girl was Amelia Earhart. She actually attended Penn State uh, Ogons when it was called the Ogons School for Young Ladies for three semesters from the fall of, 20, of 1916 through the fall of 1917. Why didn't she complete her fourth term? She was really a good student. I mean, she, she was a great student in subjects she liked. In subjects she didn't like too much, she didn't do as well. But in um, the, during the winter break, winter break of, of 1917, she visited her sister in Toronto. Her sister was a nurse's aide and she was working with uh, amputees who were uh, damaged, who were wounded during the First World War. And Amelia Earhart was so taken with the, the courage of, of these, these young men who lost their limbs and probably had PTSD long before we knew what it was called, that she returned to the campus for a couple of weeks after winter break and said, no, this is not for me. I wanna help my sister. I wanna help these fly boys. And what happened is she was so inspired by these pilots who had lost their limbs and maybe their livelihoods that she decided to become a pilot herself. So she never graduated. Uh, she, she did okay. I don't know if you could see it, but she, she had really good grades in, in French and German uh, literature. She loved reading. She had a, a, a pretty low grade in uh, Christian, uh, what is it? I don't know, I, I forget what it was called at the time, but it was a course in, uh, in Christian learning. And it's kind of ironic because uh, she was a, a very, she was a good Christian, but uh, she really liked practical Christianity, if you, if you know what I mean. I'll try to explain that to you in a moment. She came back to talk to the uh, campus uh, to, uh, in 1929. As one, this is one example. She returned many times. But I, I just want to tell you a story about Amelia as a student. This is kind of important. One of my favorite stories that I picked up in my research. Uh, of course, there were sororities at the Ogon School for Young Ladies. And Amelia was a member of one of them. And uh, um, uh, someone came to her, one of her classmates, and said, I don't understand it. Why am I not able to join one of the sororities? They, no, they're all rejecting me. So Amelia said, I, I don't understand that. Let me talk to them. And she talked to the, the head of each sorority. And they said, well, we don't have to take everyone in. So she, Amelia said, this is not right. This, is, this, is, uh, this school is not so big that you can't find room for everyone who wants to learn the values of uh, camaraderie and community service and so on. So she went to Abby Sutherland, the principal, and she said, Miss Sutherland, I don't understand what's going on here. And Abby Sutherland said, we have sororities that are not accepting some girls. Let me look into it. And she did. And she asked the, the, the head of each sorority, if they would let this young lady in who wanted to be a member. And they all said, no, we don't have to let everyone in. We're not an, we're, we're not an inclusive group. We're, we're exclusive. We can't let everyone in. Abby Sutherland said, That's, these are not the values we're teaching here. So there were no more sororities at the Ogon School. And she disbanded the three sororities because Amelia Earhart fought for a friend and uh, I, I mean, I love that story. Doesn't it tell you something about her character? I, I just think that uh, I, I admire her so much. One of my favorite photos of all the ones that I saw, I love this photo. Look at the map of the world behind her. Look at her, 
her gaze. This was taken in, this, this statement came in 1937. Now that's the year that she disappeared. Abby Sutherland said this about Amelia Earhart as a student. Once on the drill field, when she was a judge of the Ogon's drill, a beautiful airplane flew over the field. And just at that moment, Amelia was not with us on the ground. She was in the air with the bird man who was flying over. I knew that she was a child of that new generation to whom the uncharted heavens were open and whose course might vie with eagles in their flight. I love that. That appeared in the, in the uh, Ogon's Mosaic. It was the yearbook that came out every year. And it's a great photo of Amelia Earhart. And um, the map behind her tells you so much about her, her courage, her curiosity, and so on. There were other famous students there who graduated and some who didn't. Uh, just briefly, Mary Curtis, who wrote for the Ladies' Home Journal back in the, in the 19, 1890s. Her father was the publisher of the uh, Ladies' Home Journal, uh, Saturday Evening Post later. And she, eventually when her father died, she inherited his fortune and she continued working for the Post, but she did other things as well. Uh, she started the Settlement Music School which is still in existence. She poured millions of dollars into it to make it possible for uh, students who might not be able, who might not have the money, but who, who had the talent, the desire to learn how to play piano, violin, uh, bass, whatever instrument it might be, percussion. And the school, it owes so much to her. She was kind of a hands-on person who appeared at the school almost every day, one of the, one of the campuses. So again, yeah, Mary Curtis is one of the many famous graduates of the Ogon School for Young Ladies. Here are two more. <laughs> Molly Costain, her father was Thomas B. Costain, who was a best-selling author. He's the right page turners. And his daughter, uh, Molly, wrote children's stories about Queen Victoria, about King Arthur, about the, the monarchy in England. So in her own way, she was teaching young girls about the values of the, the British monarchy. And here's a very famous person only because of her son. Nancy McFeely was the valedictorian for the, in the class of 1923. And she became a philanthropist and she worked with all kinds of uh, community organizations along with her husband, but she was most famous because she was the mother of Fred Rogers, who was the uh, the, the, I guess the, the creator of the longest running TV program in PBS history, 30, I think it was 39 years or 38 years, <laughs> Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And he came to <laughs> campus many times. And when the college became Penn State Ogons, he was so upset because his mother told such great stories and had such good memories of being on campus that he protested. He says, how could you do this? This is the Ogon School for Young Ladies. My mother studied here. But he wasn't too famous at the time. But he was very unhappy. Uh, anyway, the school has a lot to be proud of. Talk about inspiration. I love Cornelia Fort. She was one of the many young ladies inspired by Amelia Earhart. Cornelia Fort also became a pilot. She was from Nashville, Tennessee. She took pilot's lessons uh, and she became a, a, a instructor, a, an aviation instructor, one of the first female aviation instructors in the country. And something happened on December 7th, 1941. Absolutely amazing. Cornelia Fort was giving a training session. She was, she was teaching a young pilot how to do his thing. She was flying over Pearl Harbor and right below her, her right below the plane, she noticed this huge red, familiar red sun, the insignia of the Japanese Navy. And then she looked behind her and she saw a whole barrage of planes, one after another, flying really low over the horizon. She called in to headquarters. She said, we're being attacked. We're being attacked. The Japanese are here. But it was too late. She didn't see the planes in time. 
and the the attack on Pearl Harbor had begun, and, and hundreds and hundreds of people were killed in the attack, and it was the effective introduction of the United States into World War II, and Cornelia Fort was there. She worked for the United, uh, it was called the, um, I guess, the U.S. Ferryman Service. She wasn't in the service, but she, enabled, she it was part of the military, an adjunct part of the military, and a, as a member of this ferryman service, which was sending supplies, bringing supplies to people, to uh, soldiers on the front or to various forts around the country. And uh, two years, 18 months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, she was giving a, 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 an instruction to a young pilot over Houston, Texas. And I don't know the details, I could not find them, but she was killed in a mid-air collision. And, and she just barely avoided a mid-air collision in, in 1941 when the Japanese planes were flying low. Hers was the only plane in the air at the time, but she, she pulled up qu quickly and she, was, she got to safety, but it was too late to stop the attack. Nashville, Tennessee has honored Cornelia Fort, its own aviatrix by naming its international airport Cornelia Fort International Airport. It's the only airport in the nation named after a woman. So we're kind of proud of Cornelia, Cornelia Fort also. And uh, one more famous uh, person who went to uh, Penn State Ogons, Joel Myers. He is the founder of AccuWeather. It's the largest weather forecasting service in the world. And uh, I, the stories I read were funny because apparently Joel Myers would do reports on uh, campus radio uh, back in the, I guess the, the 1950, like in the, I guess it was the, the late 50s, early 60s. And his classmates would kind of make fun of him. What is this guy doing, these weather reports? Wait, isn't, that's silly. And he said, no, I'm gonna start a weather service someday. And they said, yeah, yeah, Joel, yeah, yeah. So after he finished his two years at Penn State Abington, uh, Penn State Ogons, he went to the main campus and while a graduate student, he found that AccuWeather, while he was still an active graduate student, and AccuWeather, as you know, is one of the most famous uh, and accurate weather services. This, by the way, what he's holding in his hand is a barometer built by uh, two famous Italian, uh, I guess, barometer makers back around 16, in the 1620s. It's really worth a small fortune. And he has a collection of these. And he visited campus on June 4th, 2007. And he gave this barometer, it's probably worth thousands of dollars, like maybe $50,000 or so. He gave it to the campus to thank them for, you know, being part of his education, even though now it's, it's Penn State Abington. When he studied at the same campus Anymore where you see, that. that's the solarium where you saw the, the women dressed as, as Indians and so on. I'll go through this quickly, just so you get an idea. The, the dormitory looked like this. It was in Sutherland Hall, or the third and fourth floors. Look at the names, look at this, the, 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 uh, the uh, looking, looking for the word. This, the, the, sign, um, the posters are from Cornell, Andover, uh, Northwestern, some of the best schools in the country. And, and Ogons was, was considered one of the best schools in the country also. It offered courses at the elementary school level, at the, uh, at the uh, junior high school level, high school level, and then junior college. All of this happened under Abby Sutherland's watch. So this was called the Apple Blossom Room. Notice too, this was taken in 1908. These were some of the first teddy bears ever seen because when Teddy Roosevelt uh, expressed his love for bears. He was, you know, uh, a, a front kind of a wild uh, frontiersman in his own way. Uh, uh, some someone decided to make little bears to honor President Teddy Roosevelt, and teddy bears came into being. And here you see this is something relatively new in 1908. So this is what the, the dormitory looked like. This was May Day, 1917. This was a dance of the fairies. The the girls had this wonderful. Uh, presentation every year just because they were celebrating springtime and new life. Uh, but 
things change, they, they were still, remember there was, it was still a girl's school. Look at them here in the early forties. Here we have a, a GIs who are getting ready. They don't know it yet to, to serve in World War II. And these are uh, Red Cross volunteers from Penn State uh, Ogans' campus uh, chatting with them. The school is going through all kinds of changes. Look at the evolution. This is typical high school stuff, right? I mean, college stuff, wearing dinks, name tags, uh, reciting the school song or the school rules uh, at the drop of a hat. If somebody asks you to, this is 1959. Typical college stuff in the good old days when life was peaceful. And here we are again, hundreds of students gathered in the late 60s to <laughs> faculty members to protest the Vietnam War. Sorry. Uh, okay, anyway, just to show you how, how the evolution has taken place. Again, to continue the, the evolution, back in the 1960s, the Congress of Racial Equality Corps was founded and Penn State Abington had its chapter. Um, and here we see some of the students gathered in the cafeteria. It's becoming not a, an exclusive school for wealthy young ladies who are being trained to be wives of ambassadors and the captains of business and industry. Now we have people who have diverse backgrounds, who have so much to offer. The college is growing in so many ways. Diversity, it's one of our, our hallmarks. Uh, one of my students told me today, she said, do you know that two, two years ago, the college said that 59% of the student body are diverse? I said, well, the last I heard was 49%, Julia, but I know what you mean. That means that 49% of the student body are African-American, Asian-American, Indigenous, Hispanic, a combination of all of the above. When you walk on campus, you it's like, going into New York City. It's like the United Nations. You could hear Hebrew being spoken. You could hear German. You could hear Spanish. You hear French. You hear Arabic. We have students from all over the world at, at the college. Right now, I have students from the Dominican Republic, Egypt, uh, Jordan, uh, many from China. I have a Korean student. And here, taken in 2015, this is a photo that uh, from the, the, what, a fairly recent photo, our students from the Global Buddies program. When we have uh, arrangements with colleges in Japan, this is uh, Gakuen University in Tokyo. Uh, they came to campus for two weeks to learn more about American ways to practice their English. And we have students who pair up with them to teach them uh, about American culture and to give them a place to stay. So we, we've done this with schools in England and Germany. Uh, it, it all stopped though in, tw in, 19, in 2020. We hope that it starts up again, maybe in 2022. Uh, but right now the Global Buddies program because of COVID is on hiatus, but we, we, are, we are a welcoming, inclusive university or college. The college has had some famous guests too. I have just a few more slides for you. One of them was Carl Sandburg. He was a famous poet, obviously, one of America's greatest. He wrote Fog and um, poems about Chicago, the great uh, stockyards and so on. Um, he was a friend of Abby Sutherland and he came on campus on May 2nd, 1941 to, to sing some songs. Actually, they were poems of his. And one of them, they, they, some were performed for the very first time before going to the Library of Congress. And one poem that he wrote and he sang was called, Elephants Are Different to Different People. He said the poem referred, to, re represented all the easy tolerance that once existed in the world and has gone. This is 1941. This is right, obviously, right before World War II, uh, we, before we entered World War II, but the war had begun in September of 1939. And he was talking about people not getting along. And so Carl Sandburg made his mark for sure. Also, <laughs> the first lady came to campus uh, in, um, 
1996, Hillary Clinton, just before I started teaching at the college, uh, her husband was president and she came to school to push his education agenda. But actually, her reason, real reason for coming was to help Joe Huffle from the 13th district, which is Abington, <laughs> very important to all of us. Uh, to, he wanted to become a U.S. representative. And she didn't succeed in helping him in 1996, but in 1999, he was finally elected and he became the, a U.S. representative for several terms. But she visited our campus and stopped traffic big time. Finally, the um, uh, ADL, the, uh, um, the, the ADL, Anti-Defamation League in 2008 declared Penn State Abington the first college campus in the country as, as a, a no place for hate campus. This meant that the college embraced diversity, brought people from diverse backgrounds together to learn about the world, to coexist, to form communities, to learn languages, to respect other cultures, to respect ideas that were not like our own. And we are so proud to be the first college campus in the country to be so designated as a no place for hate college. Here is Karen Sandler, one of the many great things she helped engineer uh, for, for the college. And finally, this is a, a word from our leader, uh, Karen Sandler, uh, she's, this is, she's greeting or actually saying farewell. I'm sorry. She was the Chancellor Emerita at the time. She's uh, about to graduate to retirement and uh, uh, our new Chancellor was on his way in, but she is saying farewell to the graduating class of 2014. She has just a little time left uh, but uh, she was always a welcoming person. I felt she always welcomed me. I'll be honest with you, all the years that I did the newspaper on campus, 22 years, she was the only one who consistently wrote me congratulatory or commendatory notes, thanking me and my students for covering the campus so well, for getting students from the college published in Ticket and also with other newspapers in the Montgomery newspaper empire. And I, I did it gladly because my students were wonderful. And I, when I saw them growing as writers, as, uh, as, as people with opinions worth sharing in their editorials, uh, I, I recommended them for positions, not only in Montgomery newspapers, some became interns of mine, some like Joe Dara, uh, who you won't know, but he's a, also he's on the our board, alumni board today. But Joe became one of the editors of the newspaper. He was the editor of the mainline sports section. And Joe and I, he was one of my first students, like Angelo Malone, back in the 1990s. Um, he, he is still a friend of mine. And uh, so I, I, I think that Karen's welcoming gesture just is, is an appropriate way to put the story to a close. Uh, this is how we became an inclusive, diverse campus. Um, and and uh, I think it was 2017, uh, Business Insider uh, did a survey of colleges around the country asking students if they feel their, their campus is safe. And, and safe meant not just from violence, but safe from uh, internal violence like uh, prejudice, uh, racism, uh, microaggressions, and so on. And Penn State Abington came in 23rd in the entire country. We have thousands of colleges throughout the country. So just to give you an idea of why I'm proud to be affiliated with the college, I've been there almost 25 years. Uh, I've been there as a part-time an adjunct instructor for many years. I also work with the marketing department uh, full-time a teaching part-time for about two and a half years. And that's when I wrote the book. I wrote it for the marketing department to help celebrate the college's 100th anniversary at that site. And we're still going strong with almost 4,000 students, 
we're doing pretty well. Even in the midst of COVID, we had a, a slight uptick in, in, in enrollment in this past, uh, the beginning of the fall semester. So I'm proud of Penn State Abington, and, and I, I hope you enjoyed listening to the, the story of how we came to be who we are today.